today we are very privileged to have for today's um, leadership seminar series our very own president and provost he doesn't need any more introduction you all know him you said it's true thank you so prof will be taking us for the next two hours on the topic understanding the corporate game from first principles understanding the corporate game from first principles so without much ado ladies and gentlemen let's put our hands together and welcome our guest lecturer thank you thank you Jean. you know i'm always quite excited um when i'm dealing with young adults you know and one of the reasons for that is that at the end of this presentation, you might not even remember anything. But that's okay. But I can assure you that one day in your quiet moments somewhere, when I'm retired, maybe dead or a little grayer, you will remember today. The world doesn't forgive you because you, make, you made decisions when you were a kid. You are still held accountable. So look, what I thought I would do today is to share some real life experiences with you. And those experiences are essential because once that degree opens the door for you, what happens in that room is what determines where your career goes. So, this is probably too early for you in your academic journey to hear these things. But the whole essence of leadership is also for you to start learning the game sooner. So, it's okay if you don't remember everything. But you will appreciate this when it's repeated in your third year and your fourth year when you're getting ready to graduate. So there is a small university outside New York um, called West Point. And West Point trains army officers or their graduates will finish and go into the army. It is not a must that you might if you guys don't mind, turn your phones off for me. Another phone rings, and I'm going to walk out. Okay? It's part of the leadership journey. We interview, and then your phone rings. And then you go home, and you said, I didn't get a job because they didn't like me. I was interviewing a guy one time. Exactly Friday afternoon like this at 12 o'clock, his phone goes, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Now, I don't have anything against Muslims. I couldn't even care if they were Jews. But that's the wrong place for your phone to ring. <laughs> In the middle of an interview, it's the wrong place. So, guys, you got to keep these subtle, subtle things into consideration. Another time I interviewed a, a student for internship and he comes into my office with a lollipop on the side of his mouth and he was sucking on it aggressively <laughs> so I said can you step out and take that lollipop from your mouth so he stepped out took it out. I don't know whether he wrapped it in the toilet paper and put it in his pocket or he put it in the bin outside. But he came back in and he said, I screwed up, right? I'm not going to get this internship, right? And I said, no. Why don't you, let's interview. If you do well, you'll get this internship. Because I'm not going to allow a knucklehead like you <laughs> to go off to somewhere else. I'm going to train you and let you go. And he did get an internship and I think he went to Georgia Tech after that. 
So, you, look, it's not everybody that is going to be as nice as I am. Somebody will just say, just go off, and that will be it. So, you, you got to be careful, you know. Uh, for those of you coming late, usually five minutes after my starts, I lock the door. So, just keep that in mind. If you show up late at an interview, you're not going to get a job. So, this u little university in 1915 graduated a class and they go in about your age and they graduate with bachelor's degrees just like you are going to get and this was about the time of the first world war right so let me just read the statistics for you and I'll tell you why so that class had 164 graduates Out of that 164, 24 became brigadier generals. If you don't know what that is, it's one star general. 24 became major generals. If you don't know what that is, two stars. Seven of them became lieutenant generals. If you're not sure, four stars, three stars. Two became generals. That's four stars. And two became generals of the army, which is five stars. You will call those field marshals. So that is one third of the class. One third of the class made it to generals. That is unprecedented in human history. Why do you think this was possible? So just imagine this class that one third of you become medical doctors, lawyers, judges, CEOs. When I read this story about 20 years ago, I was always wondering how that is possible. And that is still, that school was built in the 1800s. And that is still the largest contingent of graduates that by the time of the Second World War, one third of that class made it to generals. So, why do you think that happened? Any guesses? You don't have to, you don't have to be right. Is it luck? which is being at the right place at the right time, were they so special in their recruitment process, where these young men, they were mostly men, I think they just opened up down to females, but it was mostly a male organization. They did the best and brightest, good luck, well selected. What was it? Any guesses? Sure. So the young man, what's your name? Abiyoku says they just made the decision to be soldiers, to be successful soldiers. Okay. Any other guesses? Sure. They what? They worked hard to get those ranks. Okay, that's fair. What else? Okay. They were disciplined. Okay. Say hand at the back. They had luck. Okay. That's fair. They did what no one else wanted to do. That's, these are all good answers. Okay. Okay, so he says, well, West Point is a military academy. People go in there to become professional military people, and they work hard to achieve. Okay, fair. It's another hand, sure. They had the right leadership qualities. Okay, that's fair. 
Any other? Where are my girls? Say something. Do something. So look, I think there are no right or wrong, wrong answers. But you should also realize that they were graduating about the time of the Second World War. The First World War, sorry. So they graduated straight into war. Right? The classroom is not a battlefield. <laughs> they went into the field and distinguished themselves as leaders. And so by 1938, when the Second World War started, they had already, they were battle tested and they had achieved leadership positions. But it is interesting to me because what happened to the rest? This was one third, made it to general, the ultimate rank that anybody who signs up for a professional, to be a professional army officer would want to attain. So what happened to the rest? Two third. What do you think happened to them? They probably disappeared into history. The Bible says many shall be called, <laughs> but few shall be chosen. Right. So when I first told the story, somebody said, "Ah, it's not everybody who goes into the army who wants to be a general, which is okay. But who wants to go into the army and remain a zombie? And the purpose of this class is to start to give you guys those tools to go out there and lead. Okay, so that's one story. The second is, you know, when people get Hire. When you hire people in the corporate world, sometimes you hire one person in a certain week or two or three or ten. So let's say in a year, a company brings in 20 people. I call them a cohort because they came in in the same year. How is it possible that 20 years down the line or 15 years down the line, somebody in your cohort becomes a CEO? a CFO, a COO, a general manager. Why do you think that happens? Are they always the smartest people in the cohort? Or somebody likes them? Or they are darker than everybody else? Or they are tall and handsome or beautiful long nails? Where's the nicest high heels? What is it? I don't have the answer. It's always been a question that I ask. How are some people preferred? Groom into leadership positions. And some just fade away. So I work with an engineer who was actually working in that company before I was born. And I was the director. And he was hired the same day with a guy who was at the corner office, the CEO, the CEO. He was a staff engineer, hired the same day, at that time, 42 years to date, with the CEO. So these things intrigue me, and I always try to find answers for them because they are important. If there is a formula, who doesn't want to be the person in the corner office who makes the most money? Drive the fanciest car, lives in the nicest neighborhood. Isn't that a human desire? So those are thought-provoking questions that I want you to think about. So one of the most interesting books that I read, and when I first taught this class, um, I actually used that. It's called Billy Bad and Other Sea Stories. It's a high school book. Actually, it will amaze you 10, 20 years from now when you go back and you read your high school novels 
like things fall apart, fragments, the trial of the Dankimati, message to uh, what's the name of the famous African writer, mission to Kala. When you read them, you always feel like, what did I really take away from it when I first read it? So books are read for many reasons. Maybe you just had to read it for a class and it wasn't interesting. You just want to pass your exam and move on. But there are intriguing things when you read. So this book is a high school book. Most American high school students would have read Billy Bad, The Great Gatsby, Angels in America, on and on and on. So in this book was a young... 17-year-old runaway kid from home called Billy Bad. Billy Bad was a... Home was difficult and he decided to run away. And he got a job on a military vehicle, a naval vessel, or a merchant marine. As a boy boy, you know, the kids that you send around, messengers, cleaning stuff, running errands. 17-year-old kid, he didn't know anything about life. But there were three things happening on that ship. There was the crew, who are the guys at the bottom. Then there was this guy called the Master Sergeant. He was like that school prefect, you know, he kept discipline. He kept all the crewmen in check. And then there was the captain and his officers who didn't deal with the yahoos. And so Billy Bad was part of the crew. Everybody would send him. He was the youngest. He was always running from one end of the ship to the other. Then one day as he was running an errand, the master sergeant, Claggard was his name, called him and said, Billy, come over here. And Billy comes over and he says, Billy, you know this ship is a dangerous place. And he's like, really? Say, yeah, it's a very bad place. You should be careful. Especially those guys you sleep with in those bunks. They are bad people. He said, no, 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 Debbie. They always speak so highly of you, sir. They love you. They said, no, Billy, they don't. Actually, every evening when I walk around this ship, making sure that everybody is where they ought to be, I'm always conscious of the fact that one day I'll push a knife in my back in one of the dark corridors on this ship. And Billy said, no. So you see, Billy is illiterate. Billy is naive. Billy is too young to understand the politics on the ship. So he takes Billy to the side of the ship, to the bow, and says, look out at sea. So Billy was looking. I said, what do you see? Obviously, you can see the sea is calm. So Claggard looks at Billy and says, see how calm the surface of the sea is? said, yes, sir. He said, don't be fooled. And if these are gliding monsters, only the sharpest teeth survives. And Billy just smiled. He really didn't know what was going on. And he runs off to his errand. Then one day, Claggard the master sergeant, the bad guy, went to the captain and said, Sir, last night I overheard a conversation when I was going around this ship and Billy was the voice I heard. He was encouraging the other ship members to mutiny. 
they are going to kill all of us on this ship and take it over. So the captain looks at Claggart suspiciously and he says, are you sure about what you're saying? He said, absolutely. Are you sure it's Billy? He says, yes. That kid that came on this ship recently, the kid that runs around here with all the smiles on his face, he said, yeah, don't let his smiles fool you. So he said, okay, good. You stay here. And he sent somebody to go and bring Billy. So Billy comes, panting. The captain looks at Claggard and says, tell Billy what you just told me. So he said, Billy, didn't I hear you last night planning a mutiny on this ship, encouraging your fe fellow crew members to riot, seize this ship, and dispose us of And Billy tried to open his mouth. He couldn't. He was a stammerer. He was so angry that his words couldn't come out. And he punched Claggard in the face. Bam! Claggard staggered fell, and died. What do you think is going to happen? What do you think is going to happen to Billy? Any guesses? Sure. Just convinced the captain that everything he said was true even if it's true or not because if he can punch him he can clearly do worse than that okay any other ideas okay so let's continue so a junior officer kills a senior officer on a naval vas vessel at the time of war. So you have to do court-martial, right? Remember, I started this conversation with military. So a jury of three were constituted, and they tried Billy for murder, and he was acquitted discharged so when they took the verdict to the captain he looked at it and said guys do you actually understand the meaning of the law a junior officer has just killed a senior officer and you have declared him not guilty so one of the jurors said, Sir, you know we all hated Claggard. He was a bad guy. Billy did what none of us had the courage to do. <laughs> he got rid of him. We should be clapping for Billy, not <laughs> trying him. The captain was stunned. And he said, that may be all true, but our personal feelings and conscience is not the law. Because if that were the law, all of us, the officers on this ship, when we go to bed, we have to be very worried that anybody that did not like you could come and kill you, knowing that nothing will happen to them. Right? So
So you need to go back to the drawing table and try Billy according to law. You open the Admiralty Code and it tells you clearly you kill an officer, it's a death sentence. So they went back, they tried Billy, they sentenced him to death, and he was hanged. So just because he was naive doesn't mean he will be forgiven. So think about the ship being the world in which you are all going to graduate into. I'm sure now you are scared to death, right? The ship is the corporate world. You find the claggards, you find the crew, you find the billies, you find the captains, and everybody has an agenda. And if you get caught between that agenda, and you know the sad part, when Billy was climbing up the gallows, his friends that he used to hang out in the cabin all shouted, long live Billy. But Billy would die soon. So look, that's a fact. That's the world in which we live. That's the world in which you are going to graduate. You have to decide who you want to be. The captain, Billy, Claggard, or the crew. So I'll just leave that to your imagination. I want you to think through this for the next 10 years. That ship with its own rules, regulations. You know, and the captain says something very interesting. He said, we live in a society that, have, that has rules. And those rules follow us from life to death. And you cannot bend those rules. So just because you hate somebody doesn't mean you can kill them. Hate is your personal choice. The law is there. Okay, so that's Billy. I'll tell you one more personal story. And I'll tell you why it's important that you, you see the leadership values in it. And then I'll go to my real sermon. So 1991 in the US as an undergrad so that's exactly 30 years from now 30 years ago today is 2020 we are in 2021 right so 30 years ago so to satisfy all those friends I had to go find a job I buy them Walkmans and send them Sony Walkman to be specific So I got a job in a place called Lee's Chicken. They make chicken. It's like KFC's competition. I still think they have a better recipe than KFC. Don't tell KFC I said that. So anyway, my manager was a 15-year-old girl called Angie. I was 19. Maybe a little older, I don't remember exactly, but I knew for sure she was 15. And she was a bulldog, you know. She comes at you with every strength in her being. And here, I'm from Africa, so a 15-year-old girl giving me instruction was a little bit difficult. But I needed the money. In those days, every hour you make $4.25. Not a lot of money. The first week, I went through training. Second week, now working as a chicken salesman. So during lunchtime, it will get really, you get a lot of cars through the drive through And then after about 1.30, things will kind of calm down until around 4.00. When people are closing from work, then it picks up again. 
You guys got to hear this. Don't sleep. You learn a few lessons from it. So on one of those days, around 1.45, I was leaning against, I'd gone around, wiped all the tables, and I was tired. So I was leaning against one of the cookers. And Angie walked up to me, her nose cone on my nose cone, and she says, what are you standing there doing, Fred? And I'm like, uh, just taking a little break, you know. I'm done wiping. And she said, no, you can't stand. You cannot stand. You got to keep your feet moving. You're going to keep wiping. And I'm standing there like, stunned at her rudeness, you know. And then she looked me in the face and said, Get moving. I said, hey, it's a gasm. <laughs> Money matters, you know. So I was so angry. So, so angry. On my way home, I said, I'm not coming back to this smelly chicken place again. To hell with it. I quit. So that was like a Sunday or so. I used to work Fridays, Saturdays, Sundays because homework came first. So two days later, I come down and I come down and I said, shoot, I need the money. So I went back. But a few lessons. That helped me in my professional career. The first lesson, and you need to listen to this very carefully, you need to learn to manage anger. You need to learn to manage anger, to tame anger. That's emotional intelligence. Anger can destroy you. Anger can destroy your career. If you get, if you explode in the wrong environment, that's the end of your career. You must learn to tame anger. I was so angry at Angie that I could have pushed her, I could have hit her, I could have done anything, I could have, but I swallowed everything. And I'm headed somewhere with this conversation. The second thing that I learned, you don't get to choose who your manager is. She was 15, I was older than her. But she knew how to flip chicken. She has experience. Somebody trusted her enough to put her in that position. So you walk away from here. You go into the corporate world. You find out that you are smarter than your manager. But there's a reason why they are managers. It's not for you to choose. Your manager is like your parents. You know how sometimes you really don't like them, but there's nothing you can do about it. <laughs> right? The third thing that I learned from her that quitting comes easily. Quit. I quit. Right? You are confronted with adversity. You are pissed. You are aggrieved. How dare her? I quit. Quitters cannot be winners, right? The fourth thing that I learned from her was never to stand still. You always have to keep your feet moving.
I mean, she introduced the world to me in a way that I've never known before. She introduced America to me in a way that I couldn't have imagined. And so, 10 years later, I'm in the corporate world. And sometimes I'm sitting in a meeting with CEOs and presidents and heads of department. And somebody says something really snide. And it is done deliberately so that your reaction is caught in an environment where your career ends. Because nobody else would have heard what that person said. But they're setting you up in a place where everybody turns around and says, what happened? And there is plausible deniability. They will say, oh, I was just kidding. And he, he would never say, I said this and piss Fred off. But you know, he or she has just given you an opportunity to make a fool of yourself in an environment where the people that will make decisions about your future are all present and watching you misbehave yourself. Remember Angie, I managed my anger with her. Sometimes you get assignments that are so challenging, nobody else wants that assignment because they are smart enough to know that if you fail with that assignment, it will be the end of your career. And so in corporate, people are very smart on what projects they get on. The difficult ones, they run away. If you stay with it, if you work hard, if you don't quit, you might just be successful. You know, in my case, I made it to director in a Fortune 500 company within four years. Working on projects that most people try to convince me that the projects will never work. So, anger, quitting. What else did I say? I gave you four. What's the other two? If you are listening. I talked about anger management, finding yourself in an environment where you are provoked. Then I talked about Quitting, not quitting. What was the other two? Anybody remember? Yes, sir. Keep your feet moving. So, I'm a director, and what happens? I still went to business school and did an MBA. I filed patents, I wrote technical papers. And from director, I went to a worldwide director in another company. Keep your feet moving. Constantly seeking new opportunities to improve yourself, to better yourself, aspire for bigger things. What was the fourth one? Yes. You don't get to choose your manager. Your manager is your strategic asset. And if you are smart, it will work for you all the time. So I'll tell you the relationship that I had with my first manager. So in America, Friday by 2, 3 o'clock, everybody is, is retiring home. People are going away for weekends. But I will stay at work. And I'll go to my manager and I'll say, Todd, is there anything you want me to do for you before I go home? He said, no, Fred, everybody is gone. What are you still doing here? And I said, if you have anything, you know, my house is just five minutes from here. I don't mind. 
So you are trying to build a strategic partnership. Or you call me on weekends and say, I'm going to Germany next week. Can you put some slides together for me this weekend? And sometimes I really want to go upstate New York. I was in New Jersey at the time. I really want to go see my cousin upstate. And computers were not as fast as they are now. So I'll actually go to the office. I'll put the slides together. I'll email it to him. And I'll call him and ask him to go through the slides while I'm still in the office. And see if he needs me to change anything. If he says it's okay, then I leave. So that's a strategic partnership. And so when he got promoted to vice president, I became director. It wasn't because I was a black African or an African American or because I had a PhD. It was because I was working for his success. I was a strategic partner. Now, if you fight your manager, who is going to speak for you? You are constantly disagreeing with your manager. Who is going to represent you? You didn't choose him. Sometimes there are even people you work with and they get promoted. And you just need to get over yourself that they were promoted over you and figure out how you need to work with them for their success, for the success of the organization, and most certainly, even a bad manager that is a strategic partner will help you advance your career. So I hope you see the picture. <laughs> you can learn from anybody. I learned four things from a 15-year-old, and it was almost like introduction to the United States, because I saw it over and over and over again. And some of you are sleeping, but 10 years from now, you won't be. <laughs> you will not be sleeping, I tell you. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about how you manage people. So you see how ministers get appointed all the time, right? You take some guy who is a lawyer, and then he becomes minister for health. <laughs> you know, and then they take a medical doctor, and he becomes minister for innovation, science, technology. Look, it doesn't really matter whether they have skills in that field or not. If they do, it's an added advantage. But political appointments, really, like politics itself, is not logical, right? But what do you do? You know, for instance, I, when I became president, I only knew to be president when I was president, right? There's no university that trains you to be president of a university. So the first time you are a manager is when you are a manager. You can have all the training programs, you can go through everything, but when the tire hit the road, then you know whether you have skills to manage or not. But really, what I have found managing people when I get promoted or when I move into a new organization the first time is you need to learn the organization. How do you learn the organization? You need to know the people that are reporting directly to you. You need to have one-on-one -on -one sessions with them. You do a lot of things with that. You gauge them. You measure their value. And you can even sense if they are going to be cooperative or not. Some can be cooperative without being helpful. So it's the same thing. If you are made minister for health today and you used to sell spare parts in Katamantong or Sulebere, 
who is from Nigeria here? Okay. Ojo Alaba. All those places. You need to know who is working in your organization, what they do. How they do what they do, what are the challenges? What are their expectations of the change in leadership? And then you need to talk to the people below them. And the people below them. You get to a point where people just open up and give you all the scoop <laughs> in the company. Talking about scoop, you know, before I come to scoop. But you need to go on the ground. Have you seen how we all love our new IGP? That parry. Everybody is saying good things about him. He goes on nine patrols. He sits in the traffic with his GP1 SUV. And even he arrests pastors. <laughs> Which is quite unusual in this part of the world. And that tells you uh, people are, they are, we are hungry for new type of leadership, new type of style. And most of you are going to manage people. You are going to manage teams. You are going to manage your personal brand. And you start seeing a lot of these things when you start forming groups. You can learn a lot from your colleagues, like I learned from Angie. So if you are in a team and you don't show up, you don't contribute your part, you want to free ride, your team members are not going to respect you. Right? Because you want to work with somebody that you can trust, that you can learn from them. So when I went to MIT, some of the classes, 40% of the marks from the class is from class contribution. So you can be a genius and get the other 60% from taking exams and doing homework. But you are going to end the other 40 contributing in class. So how I ask you guys, where, what, what were the four points? And hands were going up reluctantly. In Sloan, MIT, all hands in this room will be up because you need to score your points for your 40%. People will speak with Mongolian accent, Chinese accent. Sometimes you can't hear them, but they are making contribution. But I think about it now, and I'm saying... Just imagine you are sitting in a class of 128 brilliant people from across the world. Everybody is a manager and above. There are CEOs in the class, former CEOs, former CFOs, medical doctors, PhDs. And all you are doing is to listen to other people answering questions and you are gaining knowledge but you're not giving anything back in return. How selfish is that? So if I had my own way, all you have to fight for is 60% on your grades and 40% is going to be class participation and your skills for answering questions will go off the roof. Your public speaking capabilities will improve. Your people's skills will improve your team building spirit will improve. And guys, those are really the things that perhaps made those generals. Because I can assure you they were not all A students. But skills is very, very important. Don't go through college like water flowing through pipes. College is an experience that you must gain. You have to have skills. People hire you for two reasons. That's if they are trying to hire people so that their organization will succeed. They will hire you for the skills that you earn here. Can you program? Can you present? Can you put 
together the best PowerPoint presentation? Can you sell stuff to people, convince them to buy? Are you the best speaker in your class, the excellent debater, YouTube skills? Don't take any of those skill sets for granted. You can learn programming online, learn programming. Then your team spirit, how you relate and work with other people. That is also your brand. You would have realized by now that there's a, cl a class clown, right? Who is your class clown? <laughs> Who is the class clown? Can you self self identify? <laughs> you can have more than one, you know. Do you guys want to vote? <laughs> Look, clowns actually are some of the best leadership skills. <laughs> Some of the best leadership skills come from clowns, comedians. Look, think about me just walking in here this morning and everybody is sitting down, streaked, nervous, looking at me, eyes rolling, gum chewing, and some people were even sleeping and I saw them. Somebody with excellent clown skills will say one joke and this place all gets excited. Right? Think about if I were a clown up here and I hope I'm not clowning and you are telling a joke and nobody is laughing. the ability to change course immediately. He will switch to another joke. And another joke because he's gauging the audience. He's weighing the audience. And he will not stop until he finds the joke that you all laugh to. Right? That's a powerful leadership ability. I'm sure you go to classes and you're like, the professor walks in and he says, there comes another one. Boring. Right? And then I know students. I was a student before. We, we had a, an Indian professor, Professor Gupta. May he so, he so rest in peace. What's going on there? You found your clown? <laughs> <laughs> So, Professor Gupta is teaching chemistry, and the whole class is quiet. And he said, understand, understand. <laughs> and so, a student's hand goes up. He says, sir, it's not that we are not understanding. We just cannot hear you. He said, what? Am I speaking Greek? The whole, so am I speaking Greek? And the whole class just went into an uproar, you know? But fortunately or unfortunately, most professors in American universities are foreigners. So you have to deal with accents. So I was on building your personal brand. Incorporate people walking often knowing exactly what they, where they want to get to. And in some organizations, people can also tell when you come in where, how far you're going to go in that organization. So I spoke briefly about building strategic partnerships with your manager. 
but you also need to build relationships with your co-workers. How do you do that? Again, we go back to skills. And we go back to team spirit. Are you the best people come to what they want solutions? Are you the person that everybody wants on their team? Are you managing your image? Are you dressing for the role? Are you managing your body order? <laughs> Uncomfortable discussions. Uncomfortable discussions. But how you manage your personal appearance is important. Right? I can see people are looking away. But it's a fact. You have to manage your personal brand. Nobody is going to manage it for you. You have to negotiate salaries. Right? Everybody likes money. Everybody always wants more money. But negotiating for money in the corporate world is, requires a lot of tact. I remember one time I was given a 50 cent raise at Burger King. And as you can see, I worked a lot of fast food. And one of my colleagues goes to the manager and said, I've been here for three years and I never got a pay raise. And Fred just came here six months ago and he's gotten 50 cents pay raise. So the manager was looking at him. So what do you want me to do? He said, I also want a pay raise. So he looked at him and he said, what planet do you live on? And he was so angry, he packed his bag and he quit. Now, there is nothing wrong with asking for more money. Right? But you should never go asking for more money comparing your compensation to somebody else's compensation. That's not a good starting point. You're starting from a point of weakness. You should go in and say, Patrick, you know, last year was a very difficult year. We had a lot of projects. And you're holding your cheat sheet. I worked on that, worked on that, delivered on time. I would, um, if you don't mind, I would like to reassess my current compensation. You are selling him something, right? You are telling him, I've delivered, I've worked hard. These are examples of things that I've done. I had two interns this year to mentor, and that's fair. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll go in and say, Patrick, how are things going with you? And you're gauging whether he's actually interested in having a conversation with you, you know. He could be having a bad wife day <laughs> or a bad husband day. Yeah. So I said, look, you know, I've been in this position for the last three years. We've done A, B, C, and D. And I just wanted to find out from you if I can take on additional responsibilities. Does that sound like money to you? It's definitely better than the first one. Louisa got a pay raise, so I need a pay raise. That's the dumbest one. Did you know what Louisa did to get that pay raise? You don't. But if you ask for more responsibilities, 
It's a promotion you're asking for. And what does promotion come with? Mula. So having the money discussion is always a difficult discussion. But asking for more responsibility is a nice way out. Right? So your manager could say, uh, well, we don't have anything now in your role. Uh, let's have this conversation in another six months. That's an option. Or, I actually think that um, you should cross-train. Maybe we need to rotate you to another department for a while. These so are all things that are telling you whether you are needed in the company or not. So I have a good friend, a really, really good friend I went to college with. And he worked for Avery Denison, Scott Bernard and Zangimana from Rwanda. So one day, Bernard comes to work. And his manager says, let's go for a walk. And so they went out for a walk, his manager. And so they go to the other side of the building, which are, which are other business division of everything. They make all this ticket posted, you know, among other things. I think they and 3M are competitors. So when they got into that other side of the building, he asked for the manager. So his colleague, the manager, on the other side of the business. So he comes in, goes, they go into his office, they close the door. And my friend's manager tells the other guy, this is Bernard, he's worked for me for many years. I want you to hire him. And so Bernard looked at him like, Stan. He said, why? You don't want to work, me to work for you anymore. He said, no, there's so much happening. You don't need to know that now. So he went home really, really, you know, like, Charlie, I've worked for this guy for so long. And he's just handing me over to somebody else. You know what happened? The next day, that whole side shut down. That division that my friend worked was shut down. Was the only person that was transferred to another division. So remember, your manager is your strategic partner. He himself did not know where he was going. He was also laid off. But he found him a place before he left. So remember, manage your anger. Start practicing it now, even with your colleagues. Nobody cares about your anger problems, your tantrums. Easily irritated. Acting like a baby, whining. Nobody hires whiners. Everybody hates whiners. You have to grow up and grow up fast. Or, you know how we do it in Africa? You can go back on your mother's back and she'll use a cloth to tie you up with your legs hanging. Manage your anger, keep your feet moving. That's euphemism for a lot of things. Learn new things. Become an expert in something. Right? Learn new skills. Hone in your skills. And don't quit. Losers quit fast. I mean, just because you can't do computer science doesn't mean you can't do IT. 
Nobody says anybody should be an engineer. If you are struggling and you can't stick to it, I say stick to it. But you can always make other decisions. Right? Ask for help. Don't be ashamed to ask for help. And I probably told you guys this story about my classmate at Virginia Tech. Did I tell you the story about Walter Brady? I did. What was the story? <laughs> what, what was the story? Did I? Walter Brady, the guy that said I was coming from a mushroom university. No, I didn't tell you that. I didn't. So I'll tell it. So, Brady went to Ohio State University. A big university, 65,000 people at the time. I went to a tiny university, in, also in Ohio, about an hour away, called Central State University. 4,000 students. I graduated in 96. The university was having a lot of financial challenges. And so if you were from Ohio, we were in the news. Central State University is going to be closed down. And so I went to Virginia Tech for my master's. Brady comes in from Ohio State. So all the new graduate students were in our little offices and we were introducing ourselves. So it got to me, I said, my name is Fred McBagon Lurie. I'm from Central State University. I'm here at MS, Engineering Science and Mechanics. And Brady chuckled. Like, <laughs> Anger management, right? I was really irritated by that. So after the short meeting was over, I went to him and said, what was that for? He said, is Central State also a university? So I said, yes. It is not the reputation of the university. It's not always about the reputation. I've hired people from Harvard that I never, I interviewed people from Harvard that I never hired. I said, it is the quality of the graduate that is important. The quality of the graduate. So as fate will have it, at the end of the first semester, the great reports came out and I walked into my office and Brady was lying, sitting on his chair with his head on the table. So I said, Brady, what's up? He turned around like this with sleepy eyes. He said, man, I almost flunked out. I said, hey, Brady, the guy from Ohio State University almost flunked out. And the kid from Central State is still going strong. And then he recalled, right? He said, oh, Fred, you know, look, I'm, I'm going to need some help. You see, he swallowed his pride. It was my moment to actually stump him. <laughs> but I went home celebrating. And so when I got inducted into my undergraduate hall of fame, in my speech, that's exactly what I said. That was my speech. I came from here, and somebody tried to downplay the quality of my degree, and I watched him almost fail. But he asked for help, forgiveness. And I helped him. Brady ended up 
finishing his master's a couple of months before I did. Now he has a company in Florida. And so about six years ago, we connected back on LinkedIn. And he said, man, you were always a smart dude, man. So I said, and I went to Central State University. You know, so these are things that you have to live with, right? The morale of the lesson is that Brady asked for help when he needed it, right? Now, let's be honest. Do you think if he were an African, he would ask for help? He's messed it up already, right? Especially after I reminded him and we became steady buddies, and we've reconnected, and we're all happily married. He's making more money than I am, even with my A's, <laughs> you know? So you got you to gotta, you gotta ask for help if you need it. Don't let pride prevent you from getting the things that you want. Now, how much time do I have? 30 more minutes. Oh boy, okay. So, my fourth thing that I want to talk about, so I've given you some stories. Usually I like stories because they stay with you, right? Billy Bad, West Point, you have to decide if you want to be a general or disappear into history. Okay? So my fourth thing is leading with clarity. Leading with clarity. So we, are, we live in an environment where people are very emotional, right? People are very sensitive in Africa. But it's a princess. Nobody wants to be offended. People are afraid of difficult conversations, right? People send me CVs every day and they say, oh, Dr. Fred is not helpful. If you send him your CV, ends up in a black hole. Cousin's kid wants to come to Academic City, but they have D7. Will you still admit them? That's a cultural challenge, right? We are, we are social beings. Africans are social beings. We are connected by communities. We don't want to be ostracized, right? I had a former housemaster in Nandom Secondary School who was so strict that today his kids cannot get jobs because his last name has come to mean terror. <laughs> he suspended teachers from going for advanced training he stopped paying when he was the regional director of education. Because many of them take those loans, they go, and they never come back to teach. They disappear. So he stopped it. So that they can get jobs. So that's the environment that you are going into. Your sister's son wants to go to academic school and you are the registrar. And they have C6, 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 D7. What are you going to do? Look, I'm not trying to measure anybody's grades here, okay? <laughs> <laughs> If, if you are in our system, you are okay. <laughs> right? But that's a challenge. What are you going to do? So let's, let's do some role plays here. Should I pick somebody? Okay, over there. All right. So the scenario is, I'm your older brother. And my daughter needs admission 
to Academic City. And they have two D7s. How are you going to tell your brother in a very nice way that this is not a place for their child? And what would happen if you said it? Well, personally, I can't tell the person that this is not a place for their child because I've seen certain situations where parents say he can start afresh or he's giving a new life. So I'll let him come. If he can withstand, if he couldn't write the papers and got his D7, clearly he's coming to a higher up level. If he can ask people, then you're all right. But if he can't, then he will know his limits. But I can't stop him from coming because what about if I stop like a future leader or something? But the accreditation board says you cannot admit people with D7s. <laughs> Yeah, I'll state the facts. If she still wants to come there, yeah, why not? I'll show you. You're, you're going to be a corrupt official. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> sure. Okay, so, so I'm going to... Hmm? I'm going to let you know that can't come to academic city, but I'm going to extend hands, open hands for the child. For example, I'll let some lecturers, I'll let him meet some lecturers that'll help him, or I'll, or like, some lecturers here will teach him through the courses he needs him the, the admission, right? I'm also letting him know that, oh, I can help him at some extent. Then if he writes the beginning and he passes, he gets to come to academic so, so what if that person wasn't your relative will you do the same I won't do the same I'm doing it because he's my relative no because yes because it's an advantage for him for him to be my relative it's an advantage for him to be my relative okay this is interesting okay um, see, I believe what's written on paper isn't the full story. Uh, for example, you don't know what was happening to the person when they were writing the exam. They could have been sick and perhaps didn't perform well. So they, they have the opportunity to build that. That's the point of the school, to try and build the person up. Even if they didn't come in with great marks, it's still a potential person that can be developed and become great. Learning so much, I can tell you. Anybody else? Okay. I have a mic back there. Yeah. Okay, okay go ahead. So, first of all, we have to understand that the world is this place. Like, this world is a battlefield. few. And just like you said earlier, we don't need feelings in this. Like, we have a set of rules. If you have this, you feel like you can't come in. So, first of all, that person will understand that, yes. Although maybe you did well, maybe there was a problem and stuff like that. This world is cruel, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's a difficult world, so you have to prove yourself. This is interesting. Yeah. You have to okay, prove yourself. anybody else? Okay, we need a hot mic here. Yeah. Okay, so people need to know the difference between family and education because yes family is good it makes it makes us feel secured but in the world of education and work it's a different ball game and anybody who knows me would know that there's a difference between when i'm friends with you and when we are studying there is a line drawn there so if if you are someone who would want to try to infuse family stuff into education or into work, it wouldn't work out. I'm sorry. Right. Yeah, brilliant. Okay, there was another hand here. Um, okay, so... Okay, let's hear him out, please. 
Mine is just to buttress what Mo was saying. So I like the um, suggestion he came up with. Now, let's say I found myself in that position in Academic City to help somebody. What I would say is, like you said, what if that person wasn't your family member? There will be several instances of people who don't get good grades per se. And like Sigrid was saying, what's on paper doesn't truly really reflect the person's potential. Because there are people who are very smart that don't always do all academic. So what I would have done in that case was, I would see it as an opportunity to do something other universities don't do. And create an opportunity for students who don't do so well to give them some form of mentorship or to give them some form of support system in my school which will be making a difference in the society. So by supporting them, they can even be taking other courses whilst bettering their grades. Okay, so you guys remember the story of Billy Bad? You see how we have gravitated quickly to the conscience The juror said, Captain, Billy killed Claggard for us. We all hated him. He just did what none of us had the courage to do. That's why we set him free. That's the conscience. And the other side was the law and justice. And he says, if what you just said was right, we should all go to bed worried that junior officers can rise anytime and murder senior officers because they don't like them. But the law doesn't allow that. So it may be true that as captain, I personally did not like Laggard, but that doesn't give anybody the right to kill him. So what you guys have just touched on, besides this young woman, is the cultural constraints that continues to make us corrupt. Cultural constraints in our society that behooves every one of us to live up to the expectations of everybody because you are afraid of being ostracized is what keeps this continent down. If you want to lead with clarity, you must be able to lead with a no. No matter the consequences. Let me repeat that for clarity. If you want to lead with clarity, you must be able to say no and hold on to it. If you try to solve every single problem because you can't say no, you end up in places that you could not have imagined. What holds this continent down is these tribal and family connections, in my opinion. This str struggle to be loved, to be appreciated. These challenges we task our, conscience, our consciences with are critical. Your friend doesn't show up to your group meetings on your group projects because they are out partying and you submit homework on their behalf. You are training a crook. He's going to go into real life believing that you can free ride. That you can free ride. Yes, sir.
Okay. That's a fair point. That you extend help in hope that you will get it returned, even if it is crooked. So, four years from now, when you're about to leave academic study, we'll have this conversation again. It's not four years. Oh, this is year two. Oh, I thought this was year one. So when I started my opening by saying you may not remember most of the things, I thought you were freshmen, but that's okay. It's still a fact. Two years from when you are leaving, I'll do an exit exercise with you guys and see how much we've been able to reconfigure you. The world you are going to go in expects you to use your education to change it. It's not expecting you to use your education to augment it. And who tells you that leadership is easy? The reason why we instituted these two courses here is because the leadership because leadership is not easy. It's a leadership journey. Look, we interviewed a guy one time and he was an ad admissions officer. And when we asked him how he was going to get the numbers, he said he was going to do everything he can to get the numbers. Now, if you say this in corporate America, <laughs> you're not going to get a job. You have to qualify it. I will do everything ethical, ethically in my command, in my power to make sure I get to them. Yeah, you may want to go out there and bribe the headmistress of some school, but you are definitely not bribing that person on behalf of Academic City. So the world doesn't expect you to do everything, because if you start to define everything, we all run away, right? Bank employees for a long time in Ghana, especially females, did not have much reputation. It was almost a stigma. Even those that were not doing it, people thought they were doing it. That is what everything means. When they come into your office in skimpy clothes, all that stuff. That's unethical stuff. So yes, family will come to you. I come from a family of about 300 people. Cousins, nephews, nieces. They see academic city in picture. But you can't come here if you are not qualified. I don't care who your father is. You're not going to. And if we are not able to be sincere to ourselves, you know, even when it comes to presidential scholarship, I ask people, if I give a presidential scholarship to this person. What happens when the person with all is you can't give them? Can you lead with your conscience? So guys, you are going into the real where even sentences that you make subjected to interpretation. It may not mean much to you now, and I said that at the beginning of this presentation, that you may never remember today, but 10 years from now, something seems to start going through your head. If you can say no first, it's always important. Don't be too eager to say yes until you understand the situation. You know, I was telling somebody this morning that, or maybe it was this class, if somebody hires you because you come from a certain tribe or you have a certain height, skin tone, etc., they are not in business to succeed. They are not. If you have the right set of skills and a right set of attitude and that team spirit, 
A company that wants to make money will hire you and pay you a lot of money. If you get hired because you are somebody's tribes person, it is not for performance. It's for something else. So build your skills. And this is the place to do that. Develop your leadership skills. Join a club. Debate. Learn presentation skills. Learn to program. Do online courses. Get certification. Be prepared. And then when you walk into that interview and you are given that moment to say, do you have any questions for me? You should never walk away from an interview without answering that. Never walk away from an interview when you're given an opportunity to ask a question and you say, I think everything is clear. No. You need to rehash the conversation. So I've been using Patrick. What's your name? Samuel. So I'm going to look you straight. You are interviewing me. And I'll say, Samuel, I appreciate the opportunity to interview with you today. Your description of the company and your expectations are very exciting to me. I think my background matches exactly what you're looking for. Do you have any doubts based on the conversation we've had in my ability to do this work? And I'm looking you straight in the face. And you're going to say no. <laughs> and I'll say, are you sure? And you're going to say, absolutely. And I'm going to say, okay, Samuel, so where do we go from here? You see, I'm trying to get a job before I leave. And when I walk away, I will know whether I should send a thank you note or not. If you don't give me a job, what does thank you note mean? <laughs> eh, you didn't give me the job, I'm sending you a thank you note. What for? So that next time you may consider me, right? I don't know, I don't do that. Give me the job or keep it. <laughs> no thank you. So you need to develop the skills. I keep saying skills. Interview, interviewing is a skill. Make sure your resume is clean, clear. You dress properly. You groom yourselves well. You're more hands-on. You're actually more creative. Forget what your parents say about them being the brightest generation. They are lying. This is the brightest generation. They just knew how to cram stuff, you know. You guys know how to learn. You develop skills. People are building websites. Parents who cannot use their smartphones are turning to you for help. And yet they claim they are smarter. <laughs> how is that possible? <laughs> you know, I asked a parent <laughs> one time at the council, I said, our kids are brighter than us. And she turned around and she looked at the daughter like, you? <laughs> like, <laughs> how is that possible? So I said, ma'am, do you have a smartphone? Yeah, I said, do you guys all have smartphones? They said, can I see your smartphone? And they showed it up. I said, when you need help, who do you go to? And she turned around and looked at her. <laughs> so you see why she's smarter than you? Just be humble. So look, you live in great times. The future is bright. Stay away from trouble. Don't try to solve everything corrupt. Don't try to solve it. Solve everything. Look, you have to look out for yourself. Somebody's looking at me. This world has to change and it starts with you. If you just hire people only because they are from your cycles, I don't know if you are going to get results. Because how do you fire them when they are not performing? So let me summarize for you. Anger management. If you have a problem with anger, get some help now. Because you are going to snap somewhere you are not supposed to snap, and that's it. Your career ends. 
as quickly as it started. Build relationships, strong relationships. Be self-aware. Sometimes it's okay to be quiet. Sometimes it's ready. To, it's okay to be quiet. A week ago, a police officer came to arrest my brother over a little dispute, family dispute over property. And so an uncle says, six o'clock today, you're going to get arrested. I will make sure. So my brother calls me up. This was last week. And I say, ah, I'm sick of these police guys, you know. On second thought, I jumped in my car and drove over there. 30 minutes after I got there, my uncle shows up with his friend, police officer. The police officer waves at my brother and I. I ignored him. He went and inspected whatever he needed to, and he started walking towards where I was standing with my brother, and I just turned around and walked away. So he got to my brother. He said, is that the professor? I said, yes. I thought he had traveled. My brother said, he's here. And my brother now said, so if he wasn't here, you were here to arrest me for what? And he left. So silence. He didn't know what I was thinking. I knew he was there illegally. I knew somebody had just called him from home and given him some money. And it's Saturday, so he's coming to arrest him, and you can't bail him till Monday. Guys, this is what corruption does. For 200 cities, you will be locked. For 200 cities. And, you know, corruption is like yawning. When you're in a group and you yawn, everybody yawns around you. So if you condone it, it will impact you as well. Don't walk away from here saying, this is how it's always been. When you read the history of leadership, those that we remember are not those that said, this is how it used to be. We usually remember those that say, this is not how it ought to be. Martin Luther King Jr., Gandhi, Krumah, Malcolm X, Sojourner Truth. History remembers those that stood up against the status quo. Not those that accommodated it because they were making a lot of money. So you can define your place in history as the one that observed and accepted the status quo because it works for you. Or the one that says, is this the kind of world that I want to leave for my children, my grandchildren, and my great-grandchildren. And don't ever believe that one person cannot make a difference. One person can make a difference, right? You know this woman, Rosa Park. She sit in a bus for a white guy to sit down. She said, nope, today I'm not getting up. And she changed a whole nation with no. No. I have three daughters. None of them will get into academic city if they don't have the grades. Not one will get here. Now you say, oh, maybe on a bad day, the exam could have been... You can find all the excuses in the world if you want them. There are some people that had that bad day, you take them back and they fail again. 
Second World War, Third World War, Fourth World War. And then they tell you they have mental problems. You can always find something else to do. It's sad, but we don't all have to go to the university. You can become a mechanic. And you can be a rich man being a mechanic. I met an old classmate who ran away from secondary school. And he was selling cigarette packs in the marketplace. So I said, Habib, you ran away from secondary school to come and do this. And he said, get off my face. By the, by the time you finish that useless secondary school of yours, I'll be a contractor. <laughs> I hope he's a contractor. You know? I'm not saying he is. I don't know. But it's not for everybody. So there are some people you try and try and try and at a point you just have to give up. So guys, I'll stop here and take some questions because I know my vibrating right now. Questions? Sure. Okay. So sir, before so while you're talking, first start with a question why in a class we have some people who are business owners, CEOs and while the rest are not. So, so I think it's an issue because you see, while many of us, right, actually coming to learn about business and this thing, I'm, I'm, my question is that the school has a role to play that, that they might not be playing, right? And how can we solve that, right? Starting with this. Okay, so. The question goes back to my original statement that cohorts get hired and some become CEOs and some do not. And Samuel is saying universities have a role to play in it. That's exactly why you have leadership one and two. That's the exact reason why we are having this conversation because we are trying to fire your imaginations now to start thinking about these things. And it is how come? How are these people identified and groomed? Definitely, unless it's, a, it's your father or your mother's company, to rise through it, you have to go through a process. Right? Are you building the right set of relationships? I asked earlier, are you the guy everybody wants on their team? Are you the guy? Are you the guy people go to, go to when they have questions? A process owner. Are you the guy that when a new project comes, you are the first to stand up and say, I want to run this project. Remember, organizations want leaders that will get them more money. So if you are hiding under the table and you don't want to step up, nobody is going to make you a leader. So you have to exhibit. We used to actually say in corporate that you have to dress the role, right? You want to be CEO, you go in already and you act and dress like a CEO. You have to be able to speak. You have to be able to deal with people. As president of this university, I deal with people all the time. I deal with parents. I deal with students. I deal with faculty and staff. I deal with visitors that are coming in. You have to be able to speak. Even when I'm having a bad day, nobody has to know. Nobody wants a whiner. So all these attributes, these, all these attributes aggregate one way or the other to project you. It's important. How you talk to people, how you manage anger. These will set you apart because for one person to be chosen from that group, it means something sets them apart. What is it? If I knew it, I won't end up my career as vice president. I would have been CEO, right? We all need to figure out. Now, there's a little bit of luck. It's a little bit of luck. Those generals, those guys that became generals, without those two wars, they probably would not have been generals. They probably wouldn't. So they graduated into action. 
And by the time the second one came, they were seasoned. So they proved themselves. And that's how they were able to make it. But if you also look at the list, only two of them became generals of the army, five stars. So out, out of a class of 164, two became the overall generals of the US Army. Two. Many shall be called, but few will be chosen. So are you among the selected few? It's a challenge. Questions? Yes, sir. I'm not hearing from the ladies. What's going on? You guys want to be CEOs? I can already see some of you looking like CEOs. You know what I'm saying? Madam Boss, speak up. Okay, so my question has to do with what you said about us not trying to fix, every, like as a leader, you shouldn't try to fix every problem in the society. So with the, Fix. Yes. Like, not face. You will face problem, but fix. Mm -hmm. yes. So the scenario you give us about mm -hmm. you finding yourself in a position to help other people. So my question is, let's say you are not using your influence to like give them an undue advantage, but rather because you find yourself in that situation, maybe you are the only person who can give them that form of guidance or right um, direction. So would it be also wrong to use your leadership position to support people, not necessarily favor them, but give them some form of support? Oh, oh absolutely. I mean, look, I have received support in my lifetime. Uh, when I got my scholarship to go to the US, there were, there were a lot of delays, go come, all that stuff, the bureaucratic delays. And I just remembered when I was younger that my father's friend was the minister for defense at the time. But the last time I probably saw him, I was like four years old. So I got up one day and I walked from East Legon to Bema Camp. Okay. And I went to the reception, I said I wanted to see the Minister for Defense. And the lady said, do you have an appointment? And I'm like, mm, yeah. So she made a phone call. And I knew if he heard my last name, I would see him. And that's exactly what happened. And I told him what was going on. He picked up the phone, he called. The next day, I was on my way to America. That is an easy help, right? He didn't call them to give me a scholarship. He didn't. He just said, my nephew is sitting here. He said he got a scholarship. What's going on? And so the next day, I went there in the morning. The guy said, how come you never told us your uncle was the minister for defense? And I said, it wasn't part of the exam question. <laughs> so that kind of help, it's OK. When I write a letter of recommendation for you to go to graduate school, that kind of help is good help. When I call a friend and say, I have a, a good student that I'm looking for internship for, that is a good ask. But remember, I said a good student. So it is not any student that I'm going to put my reputation on the line for. So help is good, but you gotta keep it clean. You gotta keep it clean. Guys, you're not going to die changing this world. If you are female in this classroom, by the time you graduate from college, you're more educated than 80% of women on earth. If you get your PhD, you're more educated than 98% of women on earth, if not 99. So, you have enough education to lead and to lead with clarity. And it is expected of you, you know? Those of you who are Christians, see when David was called to be king, he wasn't that old, right? He had to go face Goliath and say, big boy, the bullying is over today. I'm taking you down. Okay, questions? 
Now, yes, sir. No, no, say, say it loud so the others can hear. Okay, so my question is that in the corporate world, how do you deal with haters? Haters? Yeah, and by haters, I mean those ones you're down for. Okay. Okay. So, how do you deal with haters? So my question, how do you deal with them here now? Because they are also in this room. <laughs> Look, the corporate world is a jungle. It's a jungle. And what happens in the jungle? The, only the fittest survives. Remember what Claga told Billy? He said, have you seen how calm the surface of the sea is, but underneath it are crawling monsters? Only those with sharp teeth survive. So Billy was in the corporate world. He didn't really understand how to navigate it. So look, I will tell you in my own experience, I always try to focus on my professional growth and in the relationships that I need to build to get ahead. I didn't bother myself over them. It was always good to know that somebody was tripping you. But you just keep going. You know, once a while, you have to bear your teeth, you know, once a while, but you have to do it in very nice ways. That conversation we'll have when you are graduating, <laughs> how to handle those kinds of scenarios. So I will tell you one of the things that I used to get quite often is you are in a very important meeting with real decision makers. So those are some of the challenges you face as a minority in corporate America. And a conversation is going on and somebody will turn around and say, oh, I know Fred has a solution this, to this problem. Right? So that first strike is a warning. So you cannot afford not to be fast in your head and on your feet. And once you get good at doing that, you answer the question, and then you turn around and say, Mike, do you have anything to add to it? And then Mike doesn't expect that. He doesn't know you're about to zap him. And then he says, what? He said, you heard me. Do you have anything to add to that? And then he says, can you ask somebody else? So who is embarrassed now? Him. So there are a few subtle ways of handling those people because they have power and they try to project it, but they don't know you will strike back and then they make a fool of themselves. That's one way of handling them, but there are many more ways of handling them, including finding a better job. <laughs> Instead of wrestling with pigs and piglets, you know, you keep it clean, sure. How do you handle situations where you were in a big problem and it left a mark in your life, but you weren't involved in that problem? How is that possible? So somebody sucked me into it. No, like there's a situation because you were present there, but you weren't involved. Mm -hmm. So when the consequences of that problem arose, mm -hmm. you were part of it. You did everything in your part because you weren't involved. You even told people about the people who were involved, but still you were condemned okay. and it left kind of a mark in your life. How do you? Okay, so this is hypothetical. I've never really found myself in a situation that I couldn't get out of. As you can see, I talk a lot. I can talk my way out of anything. I'm fast on my feet. I can run. But I've had, I've seen situations, you know, I have a, I have, I had a friend when I was in graduate school whose younger brother, one holidays, he was supposed to come visit her and decided to go visit his friends in Worcester, Massachusetts. So when he arrived, 
one of the friends borrowed some money from him. And the day before he was leaving, the friend gave him the money. Then the police raided the apartment where he was staying with his friends. And when they searched him, the, num the money that the friend gave him had a serial number of a drug stink. Okay. So apparently his friends were selling drugs in a school area. And an undercover police bought the drugs and paid him. And he used the money to refund his friend's money to him. But now they are all arrested because the serialized money was in his pocket. Well, he went to jail. So talk about being at the wrong place at the wrong time. And in the US, if you are caught selling drugs in a school zone, the sentence is way higher than if you are selling it in the hoods. So I've seen situations like that where how do you explain to the police that you were not the one that sold the drug? I've seen many things like that happening. And that's why it is important to also understand the kind of company that you keep. Because you can get into trouble for no reason. But I've never really found myself in, you know, any orchestrated, because I'm corporate savvy. I'm corporate savvy. I, I stayed in corporate America for 16 years. At a certain level, you know your way around. You know where to go and where not to go. People to deal with. And you know when you have to go take, have a drink with somebody and when not to go. You need to know when halfway through that drink, you leave and go home. You should never get tipsy, you know. And there was a case um, in Germany. How much time do I have? I'll tell you this and go, and tell you how cruel people can be in corporate. So there was a guy in Brazil. I won't mention the name of the company, obviously, because this is going online. And the guy in Brazil was a salesperson for products that were designed and built in Germany. So he kept reporting that um, there were defects. Customers were complaining about defects. So they needed to fix it. And a lot of people in Germany were not happy with, with that. So one day they invited him over from Brazil and said, why don't you come over and spend some time and let's try to figure out these issues together so that your customers will stop complaining. So they took him up out in the evening to a bar. It was October 1st. And in Germany, the beer glasses are this big. If you quaff one, you are lucky. If you're a German, you may be able to quaff three or four, you know? So this guy was drinking and drinking, and they were bringing him more. He was drinking until he got drunk. Then he got up, went into the washroom, and he pulled his pants down and he was peeing. When he turned around, one of the guys had a concorder, a, a concorder recorder on him. He was recording him naked. Essentially, you are drunk, you are naked, you are caught on tape. That is behavior on becoming of a leader. So they got back into the the, the drinking area, and he turned on the concorder and showed, him, showed it to him, and then asked him, do you still have quality problems in Brazil? And he said, no. He said, good boy, and he closed the concorder and left. That sounds crazy, right? But that's it. He's been tamed. He can't complain anymore. So, in my professional life, when I go out there, I have my one drink, I go home. When I used to travel in Germany, I'll have that one drink, I'll make my way to the train station, get on the train, go to Nuremberg, grab a taxi, go to my hotel. If I want, if I want more drinks, I'll drink it in my hotel. That was one. And two, anytime I travel on business, 
get to the front desk. They give me my hotel key. I look at the woman, I look at the key. I said, what floor is this? She said, it's the fourth floor. I said, I fear heights. Can I go on the second floor? It's just like, we don't have any other rooms left. I said, thank you, I'm gonna find another hotel. I never sleep in a hotel room that I am assigned. I don't know what is set up in there. When I travel in China, I never turn my computer on in the hotel room. I never watch TV in the hotel room because it's all bugged. So there are a few things that come with it. And people will tell you, oh, he's, this person is paranoid. Where there's a, there's a famous saying in corporate that in the corporate world, only the paranoid survives. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much, um, our very own president and provost. I'm sure you can clap again for him. This was very exciting. So, like we do it every week, um, we'll call a leader. Where's Josephine? Yeah, so please come and do a vote of thanks on behalf of the rest of us. Oh, you won't clap for her. On behalf of the whole class, I would like to say a very big thank you to Dr. Fred for these wonderful lessons we just had. And I believe that we all had something to take home and work towards them from now on. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. So like Prof said, Many are called, but few are chosen. For those of you who are Christians, you would know that's in Matthew 22, 14. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, so um, I'm sure that from 15 years from today, you would know what you want to be starting today. And I'm entreating all of you to start working on the things that you want to be known for 10 years from now, 15 years from now. I believe this class was very inspiring and Prof, we are very grateful for the time. Thank you so much. Yeah.